que mueve sus vidas. Al abrir esta plataforma única para líderes innovadores que están marcando el rumbo de nuestro futuro, establecemos un canal de comunicación con las mentes más brillantes del mundo. Estas disertaciones que presentaremos serán de lo más valiosas. Y antes de continuar, quisiera agradecer al gestor de este bloque, el licenciado Jorge Izquierdo, director de Tijuana Innovadora. Izquierdo es en realidad la mano derecha de este evento y les pido un aplauso muy fuerte para él, por favor. Y también para los afortunados que ya están ocupando sus lugares, queremos decirles que, bueno, además de esta primera conferencia magistral, habrá otras a lo largo de la tarde, como por ejemplo, I was a robot de Wolfgang Flur, Ten Arquitectos de Enrique Norten, eh, que sigue en innovación y diseño, y Cambio de Paradigma de Liebano Science, para que no se las pierdan, están verdaderamente excelentes y 100% recomendables. Bueno, pues nuestra primera conferencia de esta tarde se titula Pasado, Presente y Futuro de la Tecnología. Es para Tijuana Innovadora un verdadero honor recibir al señor Steve Gary Bosniak, cofundador de Apple. Los inventos del señor Bosniak están reconocidos como grandes contribuciones a la revolución de las computadoras personales. El señor Bosniak, a quien se le conoce también como el mago de voz, y fundó... Eh, la compañía Apple Computer junto con Steve Jobs y Ronald Wayne en 1976. También creó Apple One y Apple II a mediados de los años 70. Se afirma que Steve Jobs y Bosniak son los padres de la era de la computadora personal. Cuando Bos tenía 11 años, construyó su propia estación de radio amateur y obtuvo una licencia de emisión. A los 13, Steve Bosniak comenzó a diseñar las primeras computadoras que sentaron las bases de sus siguientes éxitos. Sabemos que su juego favorito es Tetris. En la década de los 90 envió tantos resultados altos al Nintendo Power que ya ni siquiera se los publicaban. Ha recibido múltiples premios, entre ellos en el, 2002, en el 2011 la Asociación Humanista Americana le otorgó la presea Isaac Asimov. Como detalle adicional les comento que nuestro personaje, Bosniak, es un extraordinario bailarín y ha participado con éxito en el programa Dancing with the Stars. Quiero que le demos un fuerte aplauso, como los tijuanenses sabemos hacerlo, a Steve Bosnia. Ajá. You are a very gracious audience. I met so many gracious people backstage. I wish we had people that gracious in our country. I'm one of those people that think that the peoples of the two countries should actually work out together and get along, and I'm not... And it goes along with a lot of my other philosophies. I'm so glad that this event is in Tijuana, which is, you know, a great part of, Amer of Mexico's ongoing economic revival, and a lot of manufacturing that's going on here, a lot of the products in my own house were assembled in Mexico and in Tijuana. Now, when I was in college a long time ago, back before Apple Computer, on the weekends, I loved to drive down. Highway 5 wasn't open yet, even. Um, we'd, so we'd come down 99, and we'd switch over to 5, and then we'd go out, drive into Tijuana and do all the little tourist things. I'd take my cousins with me. You know, I usually wanted just to buy firecrackers, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I was in college, bought my first guitar here in Tijuana. What an important part of my life and what it meant to me, music and relaxation of playing yourself. So many good memories of, uh, of this city. And, um, so, you know, we're, our lives have changed so much and we have such wonderful technology that does incredible things that we could never imagine. What was the world like before we had apps to do everything? And, but the funny thing is, we're just in the infancy. We're just getting started. And, it's, and basically, these, these inventions and these devices, those of us who understood what computers were, how they could be powerful, how they could do things that were like thinking, even if they don't think, we wanted to bring this technology. We thought that it would affect the world in great ways, and we thought just one tiny percent of where it's really going. We thought that's what the change was going to be. It's, uh, so it surprised us quite a bit how much can be done 
when you can put such smart devices in such small space. Our nature as human beings from the instant we're born is to explore and discover things about our world, about our environment, how it works. A baby, the day it's born, will turn its head a little bit towards sound that occurs. And it wants to know what are these things in the world, wants to touch and find its way and, and learn things. Computers don't get that benefit. Computers right now, we just think we'll program our knowledge into it. But someday, a computer is going to be like a human being. It's going to have to go through years and years of learning everything from walking to knowing what a house is, to what a kitchen is, to what a coffee maker might be, to maybe even being able to make a cup of coffee someday in my house like you could. Um, the keys to all of our technological advancement and creating new things, math, science, technology, and engineering. No, it's not, not everyone needs to learn these things. Enough of us need to if we want to be skilled and enjoy being masters of making new things, but the world needs people of all types anyway in the world. Someday in education, I am hopeful that you will get to choose from the earliest ages on, choose the direction that we take, the courses that we want to be graded in. Um, when I was young, I was taught that the purpose of technology what engineers did was they created devices that made life easier for us. For example, due to engineers, we had bridges so we didn't have to drive as far. And due to engineers, we had washing machines. Our great-grandparents had to wash clothes with their own hands for hours. Oh, that was a terrifying thought. I thought, boy, they had a really bad time. You know, and that's not really true. They were just as happy as we are now, and they didn't need to do more. But I thought, wow, we make washing machines, and they have more free time to spend watching television, entertaining themselves, going to movies. And someday, if we engineer enough things for the average person in the average home, we can all work four days a week instead of five days a week. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have a three-day weekend well, now looking back, everybody in Silicon Valley, every family needs two people working full time, very stressfully, just to pay for a home. So somehow we didn't get extra days of work, we had got more work we have to do. I don't understand that part of it, but we were successful at creating the devices that make the world very different and the future very different. Um, I became a technologist very early on in my life, like many in this room. You discover that you like doing something. In early school days, the teacher said, I was faster than the girls at multiplication. They had never seen a boy that was faster than the girls. So I thought, I am good at something. I am good at mathematics. And I was about eight years old, and I decided, I like being known for being good at something. School is important. Education is important. And education gives us a lot of little understanding of the lower elements of life that will make the really big important things out of someday. So I was mathematical. Now, teachers will tell you that by the time students are about eight years old, they can look in their class, they can tell which students really don't care much about learning anymore. They have sort of dropped out of the system. They aren't going to get better the next year, or the next year, or the next year. They pretty much give up that early in life, you know? And you can think of a lot of reasons why, you know? You're being graded, and some of the kids have all the answers right away, and you don't feel that good because you're in large classes, and you're not the smartest. So, but being praised, getting inspiration is one way that you can get inspired to be a technologist. Another way is books and movies and stories that you see where technologists or inventors go into a laboratory and they build special equipment and it solves the problems of the world and it makes people happier and it makes people have better life. And those become your heroes. That's another way to become inspired about technology. And my heroes were in, their, in the books. They owned their own companies and they would go in and design things at night and save the world, you know, and be little Superman. Um, in school... We often study a lot and we learn materials, but we don't have very much opportunity in school 
to build things, which is what engineers eventually do. We don't construct projects of our own thinking very often. We pretty much do the same things as other kids. Now, I was a builder. I discovered electronics. I loved building electronic projects and kits. I became a ham radio operator when I was 10 years old. You got a box of parts and instructions how to bolt them together, how to solder them all together, how to make a working transmitter and a receiver and send signals to other states. You were a superman if you could do that. I was a real builder, but not many of the kids in school really built big projects like that. Um, we had science fairs. In science fairs, you got to choose projects of your own. They weren't assigned by a teacher. You got to think out what you were going to build. I accidentally stumbled on to the most important thing in my life, a journal that described how electronic parts can make decisions. It's called logic. It was so simple that a 10-year-old kid could understand it all. You didn't need higher level math. You didn't need algebra, geometry, trigonometry, or calculus. You could understand it. To this day, a 10-year-old can learn and understand every single bit of digital logic in every computer that's made. They can't necessarily understand yet how to make radios. Those are still um, a little more complicated, but everything that is a pure computer, they can understand. I discovered this when I was young, and I said, wow, this is the most amazing thing. Computers were unheard of. You never saw a computer back then. They were further out than rocket science. They were in places called research or the military, but I knew that this was going to be the passion of my life. In my heart, I was going to study computers, learn ones and zeros, how to add them, how to make more decision devices for my entire life. Very early on, about when I was maybe 11 years old, I decided I wanted to build something with my little knowledge of logic. Logic were little devices like a light switch. Up is on and down is off. Simple little rules, simple little decisions. I looked at the game of tic-tac-toe. My father suggested it, that I could build a machine that would never lose the game tic-tac-toe. Huh. I sat down on paper for all day long for two days straight and played every version of tic-tac-toe that was possible. And I made a set of rules. The rules were how to make a move so you never lose. And then every one of those rules became a few little electronic parts soldered to nails that I pounded into plywood. Big, huge device, and it played tic-tac-toe. Well, I look back and I think, how could someone that young build something so huge and amazing and valuable and smart? But at the time, I didn't even think of it. All I thought of it was, it's what I love doing. This is just the most fun thing for me in the world, and it makes me feel special. Um, and I started becoming so good at electronics that, you know, I became what they call a nerd or a geek. And I was known as an electronic genius in school, but I didn't have many friends. I couldn't talk their language. I wasn't in the social groups. Didn't get invited to parties and that sort of thing. Okay, well, it just made my electronics more important to me. So it's often useful to look back and say, who is going to be a good, outstanding contributor in society, a good contributor to the world of technology. And very often, it's sometimes that person that was an outsider in school, that was kind of shy, that had to do a lot of thinking for themselves, but, you know, but really learn to believe in their own ideas, and they don't have to match the way other people think. Um, the paradigm of school is something that we need to give attention to. You are taught the same pages as every other student in your class on Monday. You're taught the same pages on Tuesday, the same pages on Wednesday, the same pages on Thursday. You're all learning at the same time. If, you, if, if John, Johnny has a little problem, and I can't go back and correct it, because a few minutes later, Betty's going to have a little problem, and I can't go back and correct it for every single person. We don't have one teacher per student. We have one teacher per 30 students when we're young, when it matters. And that's a problem. And then we get tested on Friday, and a few people are outstanding, and they're the good ones that are going to go on in life, and the others feel like, oh, I'm not that smart. And that's, a, that's something we've got to think about changing someday. I imagine the school that you can go to and say, I want to choose my grade is 
straight A's. I will come out as knowledgeable as anyone, but I might go in different directions than the other people, and I might go at different speeds. And I'm hopeful that someday computers will be a part of that paradigm shift. So far, computers in schools just are a tool that we use to do school the normal way. But um, I'll talk later on about how computers are going to fill that role someday. Um, in school, you're taught that the right answer, you are good, if you have the same answer that everyone else has. That is the correct answer. The problem is, it's not your own answer. It's an answer out of a book. It belongs to someone else. And you sort of learn through school and school and school that there's always an answer in a book and you just have to find it. You don't get taught very much to think hard and come up with an answer that is not in the book. That's the sort of thinking that we overlook, and yet that's the sort of thinking that is called creativity and leads to innovation and new ways of thinking and new products in our lives. Early on, I told my father, I, was, I felt that education was so important a part of life to giving us the tools we needed to have a job and have money coming in and have a family and a home. And I said, I'm going to be an engineer first in my life and I'm going to be a teacher second, a fifth grade teacher. Ten-year-old kids, like when I was so important, 11-year-old kids. It was such an important time in my life and these teachers meant so much. And I asked my father, do the teachers get paid more than engineers? And he said, no. I was disappointed. But all through my life, I kept in my head, I want to be a teacher of young children who need good teachers, need to be inspired, need to be motivated. And eventually I did go back and I wound up teaching for eight years. Secretly, no press, little's known about that. Um, one thing we're not taught in school is to be skeptical, to question a teacher. We'll be called disruptive. We will learn how to calculate when two canoes meet on a river, but, we, but if we say, no, rivers aren't really the right speed, they never go the same speed, sorry, you're disruptive. Don't speak up, little Johnny. Don't say that sort of thing. And we're often encouraged not to explore. There's 30 kids in a class. We can't all go off in our own directions. I want to know what's in that drawer and somebody else wants to know what's under the building, and somebody else wants to, you know, look behind a little cabinet, but we can't because we have to, control has to be maintained. And it all boils down, when you think about class size, that you don't have one teacher per student, it all boils down to lack of money. It could be solved with money, but it's unlikely to be solved with money because families with children want schools that are good, and families without children don't want to pay for them. And there's a lot more families that don't have children. And money, in any democratic society, the money for schools comes from a government. Has to be, because education's a right for all. If it comes from the government, the amount of money that the government gives to anything is proportional to votes. A family of five with three kids gets no more votes than a family of two. And that's where the problem lies. Someday I hope that changes too. Um, you know, so school does teach us some fundamental schools. And I've got to say that for almost everybody, some levels of arithmetic are very important to be making judges and uh, judgments and estimates of things that are going to happen all through our lives. We can, learn, we can apply these skills to things that are way outside of what we learn in school at later points in our life. Um, when I was in high school, I had a teacher that said you can go beyond the school. He was an electronics teacher. We had the most incredible electronics program of any high school probably in the world. We had better equipment and better courses than the local colleges. And we had it because of one great teacher who wrote the course himself. He didn't rely on books to teach electronics. He knew his class of students. He knew where our brains were, what we knew, what equipment we had, and he wrote the course based around that. Well, he arranged... He also arranged for some of us every year that were very bright, one or two of us, to go into industry. He made industry connections. And he arranged for me to get to go down to a company and program something called a computer. What's a computer? We didn't have those in school. So I got to go and write programs for a computer. Oh my God, I felt like Superman. Of course, nobody in the school knew me. They didn't know what I was doing. But I just, oh, this was the thing of my life, understanding what computers were. 
One of the first programs I wrote was a chess program called the Knight's Tour of Chess, where the knight hits every square once, and nothing came out. And I scratched my head, and the next week I printed out chess boards, and I decided my program was working perfectly. And it was going to get to the answer, but it was going to take 10 to the 25th years. Longer than the universe has been around. So, what that taught me was this computer that could do one million things a second, one million, huge, unbelievably fast, couldn't calculate a simple little problem that humans have been able to solve. It couldn't solve that problem based on speed. We need the human mind to come up with methods of solving problems. To this day, we still need the human mind. No computer program has ever come close to the human mind in saying, hmm, here's a problem, how can I go about solving it? Not yet. That hasn't happened yet. So we still need the intuition to think about how to solve these problems you know, that come from the human brain. We don't know how the brain's wired. We really don't have a clue. It's not like a television where you can actually go in and see every little wire and figure out how it's made. Um, I discovered computer manual that year. Computer manual is like architecture. The architecture of the building we're in would be described on paper, drawn by hand, of windows and doors and, and beams and roofs and sizes of rooms and things. That, well, the architecture of a computer is similar. It's where are the holding blocks that can hold certain numbers of ones and zeros. How does memory work? What are the ones and zeros that tell it what to do, like adding things? What are the set of instructions? Well, I discovered this, and I thought, oh my gosh. I was in high school by then. I said, back in elementary school, I used to build logic circuits. I understood logic really well. I wonder if I could design a computer, if I could write on paper my little logic formulas that add up to being a computer. Could I do it? And at first I failed, and then finally I succeeded. And then I got more and more descriptions of computers, the architecture, every one I could get. And the way I would get these manuals on computers is there were no computer books. There were no computer information in stores or bookstores or anything, magazine stores. But I would drive down on Sundays with a friend from high school, um, and we would drive down to Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. It was the furthest out physics research in the world. It was like what CERN is today, you know, looking for the, the God particle and all. Um, and we would drive in, and we'd drive to the main building. And we'd try the doors. And turns out the smartest people in the world worked at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. The smartest people in the world. Well, the smartest people in the world never locked doors. I will tell you. So we'd always find a door open. We'd go in and we'd go up to the second floor. We found the library. And I would sit down and read magazines about computers and books about computers. And I could order manuals of computers. Unbelievable. You know, people might call that bad that you went into a place you weren't supposed to be in. But all I did was to order information so I could learn. What I was doing was actually good. Um, and, uh, and, and so I... Um, I started designing these computers, one after another, after another, after another, and I never knew what my designs were worth. I couldn't ever buy a single part to build it. A little tiny chip that's like a light switch cost maybe $50 back then. You couldn't possibly buy these chips. They were too expensive. But I loved designing it on paper. Every weekend, I would shut my door. My parents were out of it. My friends were out of it. My teachers were out of it. It was on my own because I loved doing it. And loving, wanting to do something is so much more important than anything else. When I came to teach young kids for eight years later on, it was less important what I taught them, more important to motivate them and to have fun doing it, to want to learn. Somebody who wants to learn, somebody who wants to accomplish something cannot be stopped. It's a much more powerful motivation than any salary or stock or awards or business titles. I told my father when I discovered one great architecture example that was based around the parts that are, built, that are building blocks, the chips of the day. It was the 4K Data General Nova computer. You need a 4K computer to run a programming language so you can type in chess programs and things. Real work. Computers normally were just, you saw pictures of front panels, 
switches and lights and weird little nomenclature, and nobody in the world could understand it except a computer expert. They just weren't like today. Front panels, switches and lights, ones and zeros, push some buttons and some ones and zeros go into this thing called memory. I mean, it was just such awful geeky stuff, but that's what the world was like, and I wanted a computer that could really, I could type on a human keyboard and get my programs in. So I told my dad, someday I'm going to have one of these Nova computers. I had posters of it on my wall in my bedroom. That's, that's how geeky I was. And, <laughs> friends, and a friend of mine at school did too, when there were two of us. Um, and it wasn't Steve Jobs, it was another guy. So <laughs> I told my father, I'm going to own a 4K Nova someday. And he said, how are you going to do that? It costs as much as a house. Uh, uh, I said, I'm going to live in an apartment. <laughs> I threw down the gauntlet. I was going to have a computer in my life. That was an important goal of mine. And I didn't forget that goal, just like I didn't forget the goal of teaching um, in later years. Well, I went off to my first year of college, and computers were a graduate-level course. Introduction to computers. Introduction was graduate-level. Because I was a freshman in engineering, I was allowed to take the course. And I got an A-plus in it because I knew so much about computers already. And I learned a ton that year, and I started writing programs that calculated valuable scientific tables of numbers. I ran so many programs, I ran our class budget five times over. I was doing something good. I was learning how to write programs on a computer, how to solve things, how to get tables of useful numbers but it was treated like, oh my gosh, there was drives and the tape drives and the printers and everything and I would start punch sending my punch cards into the machine and running my programs, looking at the outputs, correcting them, running more cards in had a great time and we'd shut the thing down at four in the morning and nobody knew we were there. I was doing a good thing. A computer was sitting there unused and I wanted to educate myself and learn how to use it and write great programs. I wasn't doing anything bad, no vandalism, no destruction, but it would have been treated as though it were bad what I was doing. After my second year of college, I wanted to pay my own way through college. My parents didn't have that much money and so I went to work for one year to earn the money for my third year of college. And thankfully, from the minute I was out of high school, I never had to worry about a job. I was so skilled at all kinds of engineering, I could always run down to an electronics company and get a job. I didn't go through what most young people go through, which is worrying about what they're going to do and what kind of job they're going to get after college or something. So I went to work at a company. I walked in the door by accident and found they were designing a computer. I got a job for a year programming that computer. And I went in at night to run a program of my own, just for me. And the program calculated the esoteric mathematical number E to 138,000 pla decimal places. And I went in, I ran this program, and somebody else came in. And they saw me doing it, and they acted like what I was doing was bad and wrong. It wasn't company business. Here I was, educating myself, you know, taking, taking a computer to, you know, its limits and doing amazing things, and yet it was treated as though it was bad because it was unusual. So just wanting to do things that are new and different, you sometimes get that feeling. I ride a little two-wheeled Segway, and very often you go up against people that just want to get these Segways off our sidewalks, get them off our streets, get them out of our parks, and it's only really because it's so new and different and they don't understand it. But I was good. Well, at that company where I worked, an executive heard that I used to design any computer in the world I could design in two days. That was roughly how good I was. And so he said he'd get me the chips if I could design a computer. I went home. I designed a very small computer. I brought in my design, and he got me the chips to build my own computer. I had to make a phone call and find some memory. 256 little dinky bytes of memory, but it was enough to make this little machine work. And I had switches on the front, ones and zeros, ones and zeros, push a button and the ones and zeros go into memory. So it was like computers are. I knew computers very well. 
I built this little computer. We drank cream soda while we built it. So Bill Ferdinandes and myself called it the cream soda computer. And Bill said, you should meet this other guy from our high school, Steve Jobs, because he knows digital electronics and he also likes to play pranks at school, jokes. And I was well known for that. So I met Steve Jobs around that time. And we talked about what we knew in electronics. And he wasn't really a designer like I was. But he had been around it. He had taken the same electronics course from the same teacher at our high school. And, he, and we were in the counterculture movement. was very big in the San Francisco area. And I admired all these people that talked about living life very differently than you ever thought was possible, very differently than normal. I admired that. And Steve became more of like a real hippie. My feet were solidly on the ground because I was so smart I would always be able to get a job and have a family and be normal. So I didn't really go off and do a lot of the hippie things, but Steve was younger. And he would walk around in bare feet and a little sack of seeds that he would eat from. And he would talk about, you know, Eastern religion and go over to India. He was more like a true hippie. And, and to tell you the truth, you know what, and, 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 and a lot of movies are probably going to make a point that, oh my gosh, a lot of drug use led to what Apple became. Um, I never once saw Steve doing drugs. He never talked about it with me. So it was very subtle and minor and kept out of my view at least. Steve talked about a couple things he'd done at high school. They had taken clay and take a photograph, change, move the clay a little, Take another photograph, change the clay, take another. It's called claymation, and it makes movies. Where did that come out? Pixar Corporation, years and years and years later. Um, I don't even know if Steve remembered how he, how he uh, talked about that when he was in high school. He also talked about a book he'd read called Atlas Shrugged. And he talked about how in Atlas Shrugged, there's only a very few people that are like the Shakespeare's and the Isaac Newton's that move society forward that are important for actually getting things manufactured and done. And everybody else sort of is just interchangeable and waste and can be uh, treated like nothing and fired at will. I didn't like that kind of talk. And it's a shame that it kind of, um, I think, influenced Steve quite a bit in his life. Well... I drove Steve up to college, and he did not like the fact that they told you what courses you have to take. That's how counterculture he was. So he never took their courses, and he never paid money. He just stayed with friends in the dorms, and he never paid tuition, but he just went to classes and sat in to interesting ones so he could learn a few nice things. Um, very different style of life and education, but he was very young, and his personality was forming. I mean, while he was up in Oregon... And down in the San Francisco area, Hewlett Packard was making the iPhone 5 of its day. It was called the handheld scientific calculator. Within five years, every engineer, every scientist got rid of their $10 slide rules and bought this $400 calculator because it could calculate numbers in a display. You could type them in that was accurate, it was fast. It just, everything that engineering is about, that calculator solved. It, even in a recession, it made Hewlett-Packard a profitable company. Even though every other division of Hewlett-Packard was losing money, our calculator division made money. Well, they heard I was a great designer. They brought me in, and they interviewed me. I didn't have a college degree. I had had three years of college by now. Um, but they hired me on the spot. Oh, my God. How incredible a thing in life to be hired as an engineer designing the best product in the world. I came to love Hewlett-Packard. Hewlett Packard was full of engineers. It was driven by engineers because back then, Hewlett Packard was building the tools that engineers used. So every one of us engineers was building the tools that we would use ourselves so we understood the users. We understood the market as well as theoretical marketing people did. Values in that company, you were allowed to communicate up and down the chain of command in Hewlett Packard. It was, there was never anything wrong with going above your own boss and talking to somebody. The, the founders of that company made it that way. It was called the Hewlett Packard Values. They made parts available at night to any engineers that wanted to work at night. They made parts available to engineers like me for anything of my own design if my supervisor approved. So if I wanted to build something with chips, I, had, I could take these little $1 chips. Very inexpensive type of education for Hewlett Packard. They felt that the education of their employees, the development of their own minds was what made it valuable. Um, so 
I would design calculators in the daytime. I'd go home at night, and I had no chance in those days of having a girlfriend or a wife, to tell you the truth. So I would watch Star Trek, and I would eat a <laughs> TV dinner, and then I would start working on my own projects, many great projects involving technology. The very first dial -a joke machine ever in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I saw a Pong in a bowling alley, and I was stunned. I said, I want this. Oh my gosh, I could never afford something like a printer, which is the output device of a computer. Input and output devices cost a fortune. I would never be able to save that much money. But all of a sudden I thought, my gosh, I have a television at home. I know all the television signals from high school electronics. I can build any little computerish device in the world with my knowledge. I'll build a little machine that puts dots on the TV set that are balls and paddles and plays Pong. And I built a little device with 28 $1 chips that played Pong. Well, Steve Jobs came back from college in Oregon and he saw it. And he took my board, my design, down to Atari. And I don't know if they knew I designed it or if they thought he designed it, but they gave him a job on the spot. <laughs> so now he was working at Atari. Well, Steve, back, he was very young and he was like a lot of young people you know. They're just sort of too much energy and they just have want to talk to anybody and they want to throw their opinions into every decision being made. That impresses high up people sometimes in companies. Steve was always able to impress high up people, but it gets on the nerves of other people, you know, that Steve's challenging the ways that they do things that they've been doing for 10 or 20 years and they know what they're doing. So they, they had to move Steve to the night shift where he worked all alone by himself. <laughs> and I didn't know that at the time, but <laughs> looking back, I can totally understand it. So we, Steve, Steve came to me and said, Atari is, is tired. The, the owner of Atari doesn't like the fact that their games, their v arcade games in those days, are taking, it was hardware, not software in those days. They're taking 90 chips, 110 chips, 130 chips, 150 chips, 190 chips for a game. And they know that I designed things with almost no chips at all. I had become so skilled. I was known for this at Hewlett Packard too. So Steve came and said they wanted me to design a one-player version of Pong for Atari. Atari was in Los Gatos, California, where I live now. Los Gatos, California is very proud of having been the birthplace of arcade games. But Los Gatos is even more proud of a different invention that came out of our town, which was the pet rock. Some of you might have had a pet rock in time, probably still own it. So I designed, I went in, and Steve said, okay, I said, I would love to design this game for Atari. I'll design a game that young kids that I love so much are going to play in, in bowling alleys and in arcade centers. And Steve said, there's a hitch. You have to do it in four days. This was a man-year project. Four days. Okay, I was the hottest designer in the world in my mind. And I told him I didn't think I could do it, but I would take the challenge on. And I sat down, I did not sleep for four days and nights. I got mononucleosis, the sleeping sickness, and so did Steve Jobs. And I came up with some clever, clever, clever designs my way, and we delivered a board to, to um, Atari for the game Breakout, where you hit balls against bricks. So that was mine. While I was there, I was in a sleepless state. My mind is kind of going in and out, not knowing exactly what's real all the time. And all of the games on the, t the floor had these big old televisions, the old style hot televisions, and they were all black and white TVs. One of the video games on the floor had a little dot moving from left to right and right to left, just going back and forth on the screen, changing colors. And I thought, oh my God, did they actually make a color version? Color television was very difficult and exotic. It took like $1,000 for all the parts that obeyed differential calculus rules to mix sine waves of the different colors and phases and brightnesses. It was so difficult to build. Did they do it? No, they just had little mylar strips, red, green, blue, yellow, on the TV set. I couldn't even figure that out, but I went back to the lab bench, and I was sitting here, and Steve was wiring up my design over there. I designed everything. And... Actually, well, well this was, that was a good partnership. You know, after Steve ran into somebody like me 
There was no sense for him trying to be a designer of anything because I would always crank out great designs. So I was sitting here kind of thinking, color TV, and I thought, what is color TV anyway? Well, I went back to high school electronics. It's a signal that goes up and down, up and down, just like waves, but it goes up and down at exactly the right rate. And a TV thinks it's color, if it does. It can be on top of a whole bunch of other jiggly signals doing other things, but if inside of that is a signal going up and down at exactly the right rate, it's color. And then something popped in my head. What if I put out zeros and ones that went up, zero, one, zero, one, one is up, zero is down, one is up, zero is down. What if I put that out at exactly the right rate? I knew the way TVs are made, it would think it's color. There had never been any book in the world that had ever talked about color television in terms of ones and zeros. My thinking was always totally original. I never copied anything from data sheets or books. It was that I believe that you're taught the skills as an engineer, you make your own things. You don't copy other people's programs and all that. So I thought of this idea. I thought of this little $1 chip with four ones and zeros in it. There are 16 different combinations of ones and zeros. And I thought, rotating it around, it's going to be kind of like 16 different colors. Would it work? It's never been in a book. It could be never allowed as a project at a company. It could never be allowed as a successful project at a, at a university. Would it work? It was going to be one of the most important um, you know, discoveries and inventions of, of uh, my life. Not long after this breakout game experience, I saw somebody in a house typing on a big teletype, these big metal machines that are you know, heavy and they cost as much as a car, and he was talking to a computer across the country. The ARPANET had been created by the US military. The ARPANET connected about 10 universities together in those days. Just about 10 universities, you could print out a list of them on the printer and then choose one of, the, one of those computers at MIT or at Stanford or the University of Utah, and you could go and run programs on those computers. It was the forerunner of what we call the internet today. I saw it, and just like Pong, I said, I have to have this. Wait a minute, if I can buy a keyboard that you type on, then I can type um, into a device that I design that puts letters on my TV set, and I'll type to a computer in Boston, and the computer in Boston will talk to my TV set. And I built that device, and it worked. And I had this little terminal. Well, Steve Jobs was going back and forth between an orchard he worked on up in Oregon, and he came home and saw it, and he said, oh, there's this company locally that sells terminals that you type on to connect to computers. They sell them to businesses, they rent them, but they're high priced. Yours is so cheap and small. And sure enough, he went and sold them. I think it was the fourth time, that was the fourth time that something I designed just for my own fun, Steve turned into money. So I just, I had a great life. I was doing what I enjoyed, and Steve always found a way to get us a little money. <laughs> Steve went back up to Oregon, where he worked on this orchard. I always hoped they had apple trees there. And we'll get to that later. And a club started up called the Homebrew Computer Club. And I'm looking back, and I don't believe the number of lucky incidences in my life, you know, from when I found the first journals in a closet at home that taught me something about logic, but I got to go to the first meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club. A friend told me it was for people who had video terminals and things. And I had just designed a video terminal, so I was going to show off. I was going to be Superman and a master. And I got to this meeting, and everybody was talking about something totally different. It was about little computer kits you could buy and bolt together and have switches and lights for ones and zeros and type some ones and zeros and push a button and they go into memory and it was called the Altair computer. It had been on the cover of Popular Electronics magazine and it was based on a microprocessor. And everybody in the club was talking microprocessors, whatever that was. I had missed out on them, designing calculators at Hewlett Packard. Well, I went home that night very scared that this club was not for me but I took home a data sheet of a microprocessor that they passed out, and I studied it, and I said, oh my God, these microprocessors are just like the computers I used to design back in high school. Ah, oh, oh my gosh. Um, they're just like the computer that I built, the cream soda computer, when I met Steve Jobs five years before. 
I said, oh my gosh, the, it popped into my head right then. I can buy this one little microprocessor chip somehow. I know it's $400, so I can't really afford it. But I can buy a microprocessor chip and plug it into my little typing terminal, and now I can type to my own computer, and it can type to my television set. Oh, so I had the formula in my head for how to build a 4K computer that night. Um, how to build a 4K computer that I could type real useful programs into. And eventually I got to work. I found a microprocessor I could buy for $20. It was the newest, latest, greatest. It wasn't Intel overpriced $400 type strategy. It was something a person could buy. There were no stores that sold chips either. But this one was sold at a, at a show in San Francisco over the counter. I bought some, friends of mine bought them, and um, I went together. The, the heart of a computer was you didn't want, I didn't want a front panel. I'd done this back in elementary school. I had built projects with, where I had to drill 100 holes and mount 100 light bulbs and 100 more holes with 100 switches to toggle all the different combinations of electron orbits in the different molecules. I'd done that in elementary school. I didn't want this big mechanical front panel world anymore. I had built a computer with switches for ones and zeros five years before. I didn't want that. I wanted to type like I was typing to a faraway computer on a terminal, but I'm typing to my own computer and it's playing on my home TV. And one of the keys to it is you have to have 4K bytes of memory to have a programming language to enter useful programs so you don't have to push buttons to get ones and zeros into memory. 4K dynamic memory was the key. The 4K dynamic memory ship came out that summer and of our club, and I bought some of those. You could afford, for maybe about $50, you could get 4K bytes of memory. Every other little hobby computer in the world that was saying these new inexpensive machines are gonna change society, change the world, they were all using expensive static memories. Nobody else was being a good designer because Dynamic memories, just like the memory in all your computer products to this day, has to be refreshed over and over, and um, it takes extra circuitry. But I, I was an engineer, and to save, I saved 24 memory chips, and it only cost me about five chips to keep it from forgetting what it knew. Well, this club, we had meetings, and people were talking about how computers were going to alter education. A student was going to be given a problem, type in their answer, and be corrected instantly. Oh, they were gonna use 100% of their brain instead of just 10% of it, like in normal schools. And I got scared. I got scared that all these youngsters were gonna be smarter than me now. Of course, I do feel that in quite a bit of ways. We also talked about communication. You were gonna be able to type a message to a big computer over a modem. And other people with modems would dial in and 100 people in an hour could read the message and find out that the war protest march had been moved to a different street or whatever, whatever you had to communicate. And we also had the idea that the young person who knew how to program a computer could write programs to solve the problems of life. That, young, that person could take their own little computer into work. They could type in their company's financial data and out would come the answers of what the company should do much better programming than the big, huge million-dollar computers the companies already had. Much better than the high-paid programmers could create. A 10-year-old would write a better program. I loved these social ideas and thoughts. So when I designed my computer, I took it down to the club. I demonstrated it, and I passed out my designs to everybody for free. No copyright notices, no nothing. Here it is, build your own. Help this revolution get started. Help it happen, it was so important to me. Well, Steve Jobs came back down from Oregon once and he came to a club meeting and he saw the interest in my computer. People wanted to build it, but they didn't have building skills like I did. Well, Steve Jobs said, let's start a company and make a pre-built PC board. All they do is plug their chips in and then and they just solder them in, and it saves them all the time and effort. We'll make this PC board for $20 and sell it for $40. Now, Steve thought that way because he had worked briefly for a surplus electronics store where they would buy switches for six cents and sell them for $60. They knew what things had what value, and he was used to being able to you know, sell very low-cost type things. You know, A lot of things in a surplus electronics store 
I mean, they might have bought them for a penny, but they'll sell them for $3. That's the only place you could even buy chips. So he wanted to sell this small little ingredient. And, you know, we'd have to invest a few hundred dollars each. We were young. We were in our young 20s. We had no money. We had no savings accounts. We had no parents or friends that could loan us money that were rich. We had no business experience. We had not taken a single business course or read a book in university. But, you know, I said, I didn't think we were going to make money. And Steve said, yeah, but for once in our lives, we'll have a company. We've been doing so many things together. Well, who could turn that down? As soon as somebody said, you don't have to make a profit, I'm in. <laughs> I'm doing it for other reasons. Um, I, did, I did love my company, Hewlett Packard, so much. I was going to be an engineer for life. I didn't want to move up the org chart and boss others. I didn't want to get political. I didn't want to fire people. I didn't want to tell them bad things about what they were doing. So I was going to be an engineer for life. And, and uh, this company was like family to me. During the recession, a lot of companies laid off 10% of their people, let them out on the street without a job, without an income. Hewlett Packard instead reduced everyone's salary by 10% and gave us every other Friday off which was great for a young engineer. So the youngest person in the lab didn't get fired. I really admired them for that. And it was treating us all like we all work together and we're all friends of each other and we help each other out. Those of us who have give to help those of us who need. Um, so I would never do anything behind Hewlett Packard's back and I would never quit my job. So I went to Hewlett Packard and I pleaded with them. I described the computer that they could build for $800 with color and everything and they turned me down. And they turned me down for some good reasons. Hewlett Packard would have built the wrong computer. They wouldn't have built a nice, fun machine that belongs in a home. They would have built a dull, boring machine that engineers look at and know how to use. So it's a good thing Hewlett Packard turned me down for the first of five times. They wound up turning me down quite a few times. So Steve and I were off with our own little company, we uh, got another friend to come in with us, and he typed up a little partnership agreement. It wasn't a full corporation or anything. We did things, what you can do with no money. How do you start a company with no money was part of the problem. And we had a little partnership, three of us. Ron Wayne had 10%. He wound up selling his 10% out for um, later on for just a few hundred dollars. But he was afraid that if there was any financial problems, Steve Jobs had no money. Steve Wozniak had no money, so he was going to have to pay. So <laughs> that was part of his thinking. And he, and he really didn't think that it was going to go far, you know. And even our parents told us we were working more hours than we could ever really say we were making money. We weren't really making money yet and with some of our little projects. But we were young, and we were having fun, and we had our own little company named Apple Computer and how neat it was to always be at the top of the charts in alphabetic order. Um, Steve would, was always questioning taking these computers to a much further place. Me, I'm working on coming up with clever designs that never existed before to put color into a machine when nobody ever thought they'd get color in a computer, a low-cost computer from day one. Nobody ever thought they'd have graphics where things can move around on a screen and you could program games by just changing numbers in memory. Nobody thought you'd have pixels on the screen, like photographs. All these things were in the Apple II. Game paddles for game playing built in, and it was fewer and fewer parts than any computer that had ever been designed in history, really. So it was an amazing, amazing machine we had, but um, Steve was always asking, can you add a disk? I said, yes, 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 you can someday, because I know you can always add everything, but my head is working on getting all the code done, getting the computer doing all of its things. I had to write a computer language. Remember, you don't have a useful computer unless you can type in your own programs to solve problems. Well, there was no programming language that came with this microprocessor I bought for $20. Bill Gates had written a language called BASIC for the Intel microprocessors. Now I thought, Bill Gates, his name got famous in our club. Everybody knew the name Bill Gates had written a BASIC. And I had never taken a class in writing programming languages, but I had thought about it for quite a few years in my life how to do it. And I decided if I write the first basic programming language, had to be basic, that was what was going to take over the world because there were a lot of games in basic. If I write the first one for my microprocessor, I'll get famous like Bill Gates in my club. They'll know my name. 
And I sat down and I had two purposes in my language. At Hewlett Packard where I worked, we had a big computer and everyone had to sh take turns signing up to get on one at a time. We, we engineers would take, would run our programs and test things out and I wrote a lot of programs to test my circuit designs. I, th I wanted my own computer to be able to solve all those problems and do that work for me so I didn't have to use Hewlett Packard's, my company's computer anymore. And I also wanted to play games. That was very, very important to me. I came from a big game background. So, so anyway, well, we started out with the, um, this computer that we called the Apple One computer. Changing point in history. Every computer before the Apple One had a big front panel with switches and lights, just like I had built five years before, and buttons you can push to get things in America. Every computer looked intimidating and awful and, and ugly and... And, the, and um, by taking advantage of new technology that let me include on a couple of chips a small little program that watched what I typed, and it used a television set that was free for output, all of a sudden every computer since the Apple One has now had a keyboard and a video display. So anyone looking over my shoulder, the formula was out of how to make it. Well, we started selling this little Apple One uh, the boards, we were going to sell the boards for $40, and right away Steve came to me. The local store, there was one computer store in our entire Silicon Valley area, and they wanted to buy completely built computers with all the parts. They gave us a $50,000 order. We had, I had to sell my most valuable possession in the world to get a few hundred dollars to finance this company. And we had a $50,000 order. How do you build the computers when you have no money? We got the parts on 30 days credit. We had 30 days to pay for them. We built up the computers and t tested them in 10 days and drove them down to the store and got paid cash. That was how we did it. The garage was a nice little hangout in our front, but we didn't really do any business there. We never did any computer design there. We didn't do phone calls to stores to sell our computer. We didn't do phone calls to parts suppliers to get parts. We didn't do phone calls to um, the press to get publicity. Steve did all that from his bedroom. There was no phone out in the garage. The computers were manufactured at a place in Santa Clara. We would drive them to the garage and then put the computers down. I would plug them together, look at them, and if it worked, good. And if it didn't work, I'd fix it, and we'd put the computer in a little white box to drive to the store and get paid cash. That was how we ran it for this little garage period. But before we ever shipped an Apple I computer, I had designed the Apple II from the ground up, based around color. And here it was, the world that people never expected in computers. Steve and I looked at it. I typed a number on a keyboard, and a blue square popped up on my TV screen. I typed another number, and another yellow square popped up. And we looked at each other, and we knew that this product was going to be incredible. My engineer friends at Hewlett Packard, even though I'd been turned down three times so far, my engineer friends said this was the best product they'd ever seen in their life. Steve and I weren't going to give this one away for free. Problem is, we could sell a thousand of them now. This world of computers was getting huge. We were going to change the world. We were going to sell a thousand. Whoa, the world was changing. And the trouble is, where do you get the money to build a thousand when you have no money? We started looking at companies that might take us on. They, they give us money, venture capitalists. We finally found an angel, Mike Markula, and he joined us. He invested $250,000. He owned as much stock as Steve Jobs and myself. You never hear about him because he didn't come from the bottom up having done the Apple One computer. He taught us how to run a company, what kind of people we had to hire, what our job responsibilities were, and how to be professional. And so he, more than anyone else, really made Apple the successful company that it needed, given the starting ingredients of Steve Jobs' driving spirit to have a great company and be important, and my great engineering designs. So the Apple II got out, kind of changed the world. Our programs were on little cassette tapes. You'd push a button on your cassette tape recorder, because cassette tape is free. Bzzz, beep, and your program's in memory running. Okay, after about one year, they were gonna allow personal computers into the CES show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas, I'd heard about that on television. It was a grand city. But Apple, Apple was gonna go, but only three people were going. Our investor, Mike Markula, who ran marketing, our sales guy, Gene Carter, and Steve Jobs were gonna go to show our product. And I, I wouldn't raise my hand and say, can you pay some money for me to go to see Las Vegas? 
because I wasn't needed to sell. But I'm, but I'm always tricky. I'm always trying to think. I'm always thinking a little ahead. And I said, if we have a floppy disk, can we show it? And the show was in two weeks. And Mike Markless said, yes. What that meant was if I developed a floppy disk in two weeks where I could say, run checkbook, and the checkbook program would run, I get to go to Las Vegas and see the lights. <laughs> I had never been around a disk drive of any sort in my life. I had never studied them. I had never been around a disk operating system. But I had a personal goal. If I'm going to see those lights, I'm going to figure out how to do this. <laughs> and I started taking apart a, a, a new upcoming, upcoming five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive, started analyzing their circuits, and I figured out all their chips were doing was forcing you to speak their language, and they were useless. All you wanted to do was send the signal into the disk and get, it, get the data back out of the disk and tell a head to click, 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 step tracks forward and back, which only took a few wires. So I took off all their chips. Steve Jobs loved it because it gave him negotiating potential. He would say, sell us the floppy disk, but you don't have to put all those chips in anymore for us. We've got a special design. I designed a little board with some of the cleverest little thinking circuits on it, all with seven little $1 chips doing the entire job of reading and writing the data, and it worked. Well, I said, when I got done, I said, I must not be doing important things that disks do, because mine is only seven chips, and all the other ones take 50 chips, even if one of the chips is a huge big chip designed to do the entire job. So I went and I explored and studied a competitor's design at that point, of their floppy disk controller. Oh my God, in the end, I said, mine does more. It's more flexible. I can write little programs on my own computer that change its characteristics. And we had a huge winner again. But it was for a personal reason. It wasn't because I got paid a salary to do this. After that, we had a few failures at Apple. We saw the market was going to business users because they wanted the first killer app, VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet ever, the first Excel-like program. And as it went to the business market, Steve Jobs was always worried the competition was going to be on our throats and on our necks. We were building this huge, successful Apple II market that was going to give us revenues for the next 10 years anyway, um, huge revenues. But he was just always worried, we have to move on to the next thing, the next thing. So, so our engineers designed the Apple III. And it would boot up in, with a switch on it. It could boot up as an Apple II to run all the thousands of software that was out there, thousands of pieces of software for the Apple II, or you put the switch the other way and it boots up, and now it's a new Apple III business computer. But we actually got told in engineering by marketing. We were a marketing-driven company. We had to put extra chips in, extra money in, to disable the features that businessmen wanted on an Apple II, so they wouldn't think that the Apple II is the right machine for them. We put chips in to disable what people wanted the most. In the end, the Apple III didn't have software, the hardware was buggy, it didn't work, it did fail, it was a total failure. When we fixed it a year later, it still wouldn't sell because it had a bad reputation. I think the best thing we could have done was call it the Apple IV. After that, Jeff Raskin came in and taught Steve Jobs and I, you've got to put software into these machines to make them so easy that anybody can understand them. He's the one that brought this ease of use to us. He took us to Xerox Park Center, and there we saw, instead of an arrow key that can move things in one dimension, you had a mouse that could move things in two dimensions on a two-dimensional TV screen, just like the eye sees it. So, he, so really, um, Steve Jobs got excited, but this machine cost $50,000 from Xerox. Steve said, oh, Woz is great at making things cheap. We at Apple, we're going to make this at human prices. And actually, we started a program. We developed the lease, a computer, but one megabyte of RAM is, all, is what it took to do the job right. And it cost $20,000 for our computer in today's dollars, and that just won't sell as a personal computer. So the Macintosh uh, st had started up under Jeff Raskin, had the most creative people in Apple, the people who couldn't be hired anywhere else in Apple the ones that just thought for themselves independently, the ones that had never gone to college but learned to design as well as I designed by looking at my designs. They were in the Macintosh group, my favorite friends, and I was in that group, but I had an airplane crash. And five weeks later, when I came out of amnesia, I called up Steve Jobs and said, I am going back to college to get my degree. If Apple had never happened and been successful, I would have got a college degree. 
And I, I'm so glad that I was able to stay the person I would have been without that huge success. I didn't want to go to my head to where I would only have power and control and money and invest more and, and be around CEOs. No, I wanted to be around the interesting people of the world that make the new crazy things. Um, the Macintosh failed. Failed very drastically at first, but we had huge revenues coming in from the Apple II. And that bought us time to build our future into the Macintosh computer over years, and eventually it became the highlight. The most exciting day ever for me at Apple was the day that the Macintosh was introduced, and Steve Jobs was presenting it as overturning the way that everybody has to go down the same course as everyone else, and we're the bright specter on the block. We're the one that's doing things differently and saying, think for yourselves. What a great image. Well, eventually, Steve um, was having run-ins with people and problems and the Macintosh had failed and he was put off that project so he left Apple. He felt inside that he was meant to design computers and that he was too limited to do it at Apple. Steve had been very young in his approach to the company. He always wanted to be involved in high-level decisions but he wasn't patient and had the ability to communicate and deal with people the right ways. Well he went away and he formed his own companies uh, Pixar came out of it, and he had this company next. He learned to be an extremely professional businessman, to worry about all the different aspects of a company that makes it succeed or fail in terms of profitability and great products that you can build. So when he returned to Apple, because Apple had some low days, we knew how to keep making Macintoshes, but they were just, and they would sell into the Macintosh market over and over. They were newer, better machines, but they weren't special. They weren't that piece of jewelry that you see in Apple products today. So Steve came back and he wanted to bring us back to the origins. And his first time on stage, I had tears in my eyes because I was hearing the words that were like the way we started Apple and the reasons we started it and we wanted to make the greatest stuff and it wasn't for money, it was for the world. Um, the great products that changed our life so much in recent times took a few years to come out and it really started with the iPod. You held the iPod in your hand. You couldn't judge this machine on paper specs very well and say it was going to be so great, but once you used it with your own physical hand and, and swirled things around and scrolled through menus, and it, it was the greatest music device of your life, and you would never want to use any of the other MP3 devices that came out. The best music program in the world was on this tiny little, the Macintosh only had 10% of the market or less, but we had Sound Jam at first was only on the Macintosh. We bought them and called it iTunes, and we made it into iTunes. What an incredible idea to sell music not in record stores and to actually have real, real authorized sales. Who would have predicted, you know, that we would just turn things over and you could hardly find any CD stores anymore? Music distribution was going to go to this Internet idea. Steve was always looking way to the future and was inspired by the fact that things happen out on the internet, not right where you are, but they can be what you need to use, and they come over wires. He had that ability to see the future and the vision. The iPhone was one of the greatest inventions of all time. I had been around, I'd been on boards of companies that made internet phones that could do email and browsing and YouTube and stuff like that, a little bit, but they were kind of clunky. Here came the iPhone. It was the first one that was a miniature computer on a phone. It was a computer in your pocket, and that changed the world so much, and I'm so glad for it. Apple now has a world of products that all work together. Apple has, used to have one company. It was a computer company, and it was very big and successful. But now we've got a whole bunch of other companies that are just as big and important and successful. We've got the iTunes company. We've got the iPod company. We've got the retail stores that are so incredible. We've got the iPhones and we've got the iPads. These are all such, so huge in the world. We're many companies in one. The way we can do it is they all work together. They're not independent companies. They all work with each other. And it's that kind of, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a closed mentality that sometimes guarantees you the best result with products. I don't like things closed. The Apple II was wide open and made it successful. Well, every step of the way that I've seen in computers, they've gotten more and more like a real human that you're dealing with. When I got my Newton message pad from Apple, I hand wrote a note to myself, Sarah, Dennis, Tuesday, 2 p.m. And I pressed a button called assist, it opened up my calendar. Tuesday at 2 p.m., a note for the dentist, Sarah out of my address book. I wrote the note for myself, a human, but this computer understood me. Ever since then, that's how I want computers to work. Now I would take Siri and say, what are the five largest lakes in California? 
one, two, three, four, five, I get the answer. Oh my God, I'm speaking the way normal people speak. I don't have to think about following procedures. I'm tired of typing and working my way around typing procedures. Anytime I can to send an email to record where I'm checking in, I want to do it with my voice because it's so simple. And I feel like my brain is working less and technology should make us work less. There's a great future in natural language because of processing so much of this natural language and eventually we're going to be processing video from your devices. My little device has all of the human sensory elements almost. It's got a sense of touch like I have a sense of touch. It knows how it's moving like my inner ear. It knows where it is from GPS. I don't even know that. It can hear me with its ears. It can see me with its eyes. Someday it's going to be watching the world as I go around and telling me, oh, something you're interested in is over there and answering all my questions as they come up. It's going to be like a person, and I'm going to talk to it like a person, and it's going to know my heart and soul better than I do. Computers are going to be conscious, maybe 40 years, so it's a long, long ways off, but it's going to be a big day because finally a computer will be like a human teacher and will be able to have one-on-one -on -one teaching. Um, data centers have to process all this information, speech and video, more of the, the calculations of the world. When you use your products, you think this product's really smart and it's got a big computer inside. No, it's always going over the internet through apps. And most of the processing, most of the information is taking place out there on the cloud, on the web somewhere. And data centers are going to be growing for ages and ages. I'll tell you, I don't know why there aren't, there should be some big data centers here in Tijuana. That'd be a great uh, future. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to a few question and answers. Thank you very much for listening. Bien. I think we've got 10 minutes. Tenemos. Tenemos poco tiempo, por lo tanto, le, eh, tenemos tiempo únicamente para tres preguntas. Les vamos a pedir que sean muy concisos, que sea la pregunta así como por qué, para qué o lo que sea, pero rápido para poder aprovechar el tiempo. Primero vamos a, a este lado. My name is... Hello, Steve Jobs. My name is Daniel Baker. Hello, Steve Bosnack. My name is Daniel Baker. I have 12 years. And my question is, what difference is the iOS 6 of the iOS 5? Hello, I don't hear anything. Okay. ¿Por qué no se las haces en español? Trae, trae un traductor. Yeah. Hola, Steve Bosnack. Mi nombre es Daniel Baker. Tengo dos años. Y mi pregunta es, ¿qué diferencia hay entre el iOS 6 <laughs> to tell you the truth, I didn't feel a major change in my life with iOS 6. Um, some people talk about it brought Apple's own map system, which a lot of people are finding has problems. But I expect those problems to go away with over time and be like other Apple products, which are exceptionally better than other products in the world. So I expect it to be better. I remember when Google Maps was brand new on my computer, and even on Android phones, and in the early days of Google Maps, made a lot of mistakes too. Um, iOS 5 and iOS, if you're familiar with using any version of iOS, it's very easy to step up. Apple doesn't confuse you a lot. They sometimes build in things work a little faster, smoother, or things are a little better positioned to catch your eye and attention, better user interface. Mr. Wozniak, uh, I understand um, you, the importance of education, as you mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance on your own family? I understand your father was also an engineer. How, how, his, how did he help you, or how did he guide you as a very young and intelligent boy at the time? Huh? Well, I was very lucky um, for, I had a great father who not only was a great engineer, but he would never impress his values on those of us in the family. He would point out alternatives, different ways that people think, and then he would let us choose which way we wanted to go in life. I'm the only one that chose to be an engineer like him. I liked going to his work and seeing little signals on screens and seeing what engineers do. I saw how hard he worked. But more than that, he was an excellent teacher. 
When I had a question, how can you make this sort of a thing? He would pull out a blackboard and teach me very patiently, very simple, never leave me behind, never act like it, like it wasn't something I should, I should learn and know how to use. So I was very lucky, and when I had children, I brought, I brought them up, I hopefully the same way. I didn't try to impress my values on them, just tried to educate them. And I had very extreme patience, which turned out to be a blessing. I found out that I was a good teacher when I taught for eight years. No hay nadie acá. Entonces, tenemos la tercera yeah. pregunta, tercera y última pregunta. Hi, Steve Wozniak. I'm Javier Murillo. I'm a computer engineer. And uh, what do you think about uh, intersection of medical uh, engineering? Medical internet. No, bueno, uh, I can't speak in Spanish. Well, ¿qué piensas acerca de la medicina, y la intersección de la medicina y la y la ingeniería en computación? The information, uh, the, the intersection of medicine and computer engineering. Well, there are an awful lot new devices. We're getting close to the point that, well, doctors are very well trained. They learn a lot, just like engineers. And believe me, engineers, good engineers know is, have to use as much intellect as a doctor. They don't just don't get paid as much. <laughs> they have to know as much as any lawyer, much more to deal with and get their stuff done, but they don't get paid, you know, a tenth as much. Um, but we're getting to the point that we're going to have machines that can do very good personal diagnosis and help lead you to conclusions and tell you what medications are necessary. And it's not going to ne necessarily become from a human. So we could cut the cost of medical practice hugely that way. Of course, the doctors will have to find, have to become engineers. Um, there are, it's very interesting right now that, okay, I've got devices that measure my blood pressure. They take the reading into my iPhone. It's automatically put on the web, and my wife and my best friends can actually see it, and so can my doctor if he wants. These kind of little advances in the communication of uh, medical condition are going to be very useful. Um, so uh, it's going to gain some level of popularity, and you're going to run into problems when it gets into actually prescribing medicines. Muchas gracias por todas sus preguntas. Um, I want to say this iPad has been very valuable to do my job as a master of ceremonies during the last week. I want to make it even more valuable, please. Oh my gosh, yes. My Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Galicot. Mr. Uh, Gonzalez Luna from Tijuana Innovadora. Yeah, I think I'm done. Fíjense que en la parte financiera, cuando planeamos la posibilidad de que viniera Steve Bosnia hace dos años y medio, cuando quisimos que viniera, este, eh, fuimos muy listos realmente porque invertimos en acciones de Apple y se han centuplicado, ¿eh? Para nosotros, ¿qué, ¿cómo que se siente ver a un personaje humano que ha creado tantas cosas, que platica de las cosas con una sencillez tremenda, que habla de sus emociones, de su familia y de sus ideas? Con una, con, quiere decir que es posible, ¿no? No hay gigantes, es un hombre genial y precioso. Y gracias por estar aquí. Thank you very much for being here. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you so much. We, we have to do something. We have to do something. We have to give this back. Give this back to him. Okay. And uh, give this. Um, give I would. This. Yes. I would rather be known as being a generous, good person than designing the Apple computer. You, you are a generous. Person. Starting the revolution. Yeah. And I can share one small story about Mexico, Mexicans. Yes. When I, I lived in Cuernavaca, studying Spanish one summer, I met a young gentleman in high school in Mexico City. He was so brilliant, and back that, long, long ago, more than 20 years ago, he didn't feel that what he needed to be the best mathematician in the world was offered in the university in Mexico City. And, and I, like I did with many, many people in those days, when I had a lot of money that I didn't want, I would give them money to help them in their life, and the, I made a principle, you don't pay me back money, you pay me back by when you're successful, 
you will help other young people that need your help. Well, and this was long before that movie. I, I did this with everybody over and over in my life, long before that movie, Pay It Forward. But Arturo, I paid for his education in London. He came to work. He wanted to work for a company taking this brand new thing called the Internet and putting avatars on so you could play games and see other people walking around looking like real kind of walking caricatures. And he turned down like a million-dollar offer from Microsoft because he didn't want to be influenced by money. He wanted to do pure good things for computers. He wound up, that company went under, he wound up working for Yahoo in charge of their encryption. And then, now he's in charge of software at Facebook. A very incredible story for development. And he, we have lunch, breakfast all, every, all, regularly, and he always tells me of who, what young people he's helping and how he's helping them find things. Me van a ayudar, ¿verdad? Por supuesto. Vean la cara cuando, cuando le tomen la mano. Observen esto. Me llama, me encanta eso. Excuse me, sir. Ok. Thank you. Thank you. That's very gracious. Have a great day. Bueno, pues.